Oh, we just praise you, Lord. Oh, we just praise you, Lord. See, I just believe God's getting ready to do something in this last hour. Yes. Yes. I believe God's getting ready to pour out His Spirit and move and work. I, I believe we're going to see healings and deliverances. I, I believe we're going to see demons cast out. But more than anything, I believe we're going to see souls saved, lives yes. changed, yes. marriages restored. Yes. We serve a big God, church. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. He can give out and still have as much as he had because he's God. That's right. God can give wisdom, but he loses no wisdom because he has all wisdom. Right. God can give strength, but he doesn't deplete his strength because he has all strength. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Yes. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. John the Baptist is talking. In fact, Jesus said this of John the Baptist. Jesus said, there's none greater. Jesus himself said there's not a greater preacher than John the Baptist. So here's what John says. Matthew 3.11. John says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But there's somebody coming after me. He's mightier than I am. Yes. His sandals I'm not even worthy to carry. And he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost Amen. and fire. Amen. Amen. And then in Luke 12, 49, Jesus is now talking. And Jesus says, I came to send fire on the earth. And he said, oh, how I wish it was already kindled. Yeah. He was saying, I wish I was already there so I could kindle the fire on the earth. And then Hebrews 12, 29, the writer of Hebrews is saying, for our God is a consuming fire. Yes. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I feel your anointing today. And God, I acknowledge that without your strength and without your wisdom, I can do nothing. And it is your anointing that takes the foolishness of the preaching and makes it effective. Lord, I pray, God, that you bless the hearer today. Lord, whether they're here physically, they're watching online, God, I just pray your word would go forth. It's not about me. It's not about the Iker Church. It's about Jesus Christ. Lord, have your way today, God. I pray, God, that you do a great great work, and we're going to give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' holy and mighty name. And everybody say it. Amen. 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 You might be seated. Thanks for coming today. Hallelujah. Our God is a consuming fire. Yes. If you believe God's word, you can't deny that God is a God of fire. Well, you know what? If you don't believe God's word, God is still a God of fire. Yes. The fire is powerful. Amen. See, fire consumes fire. It gives both light and heat. Fire purifies. Fire draws attention. You can't, you can't hide a fire. It, it, it attracts people. Fire changes things. Fire always leaves its mark. And God is a God of fire. Amen. There's two types of Christians. Or you can break Christians into two categories. There are those who have the fire of God and there are those who don't. Amen. You can break churches into two types of churches. There are the churches that have the fire of God, and when a church has the fire of God, they have a drawing effect. There's something there. There's power there. There's something that changes within those churches that don't have the fire of God. It doesn't make them any less. It doesn't mean that one church is better or greater, but I don't want to go to a church that don't have the fire. I don't believe church ought to be a dead, boring, dry place. I want to be a part of a church that has the fire of God. I, yeah. I want to be around saints and Christians who yeah. have the fire of God in their life. Yeah. They just draw you in and it's not them, but it's the fire inside of them. Right. Here our text today lets us know that Jesus desires for you and I to be on fire for Him. He says, I wish that the fire I'm going to send was already kindled, already started. Jesus desires for you and I to be filled with the power of God. How many know that we need power today? Yes. We need wonder-working power. We need power against the forces of darkness. We need power against the New Age movement. We need power against the atheist movement. We need power against the do-good doctrine. We need power against the couch on the uh, stadium church type of movement. We need power. And that power comes from 
Jesus Himself. Yes. Jesus desires us to be on fire for Him. There's something about a people who's on fire for God. There's something about a church that's on fire for God. They have a passion. See, that's the kind of preaching I want. That's the kind of music I want to hear. That's the kind of testimonies I want to witness is those who are on fire for God. Now, throughout history, God has used fire. And we can see it when we read the Bible. In fact, the first mention of fire is in Genesis 3.24. Adam and Eve had messed up. God ejected them from their home. And he placed an angel with a flaming sword at the entrance of the Garden of Eden. And so every day, Adam and Eve would look back and see that fire would draw their attention to how they abandoned God and they messed up. When Abraham offered up a sacrifice in Genesis 15, 7, God showed up like a burning oven and a burning torch. You know what God had to do to get Moses' attention? See, Moses was comfortable in life. He, was, he had left Egypt because he murdered a man. Egypt didn't want him. His own people didn't want him. So he moved to the land of Midian. He got married. He had kids. He was comfortable. But God had a plan. Now, can I tell you that? God has a plan for you. Yeah. You may have abandoned it. You may have forsaken it. You may have think you might run it and then you're too old or too young. But God has a way of getting your attention. And on the back side of a mountain, while Moses was minding his own business and he was happy in life where he was at, God set a bush on fire and the bush wouldn't burn up. And Moses said, i got to check it out. See, God is a God of fire. How did God protect the Israelites in the wilderness? He protected them by a pillar of fire at night when the enemies, they said, oh, we're not going to mess with that. Their God is a God of fire. That same pillar of fire kept them warm and it gave them light. I like to read about when Solomon dedicated God's house and he prayed a simple prayer and all the people worshiped and the Bible says the heavens opened up and fire fell from heaven and consumed the altar and God had already told the Levitical priest, when I set the altar on fire, to be a perpetual fire. Amen. How about Elijah? Elijah was a man that stood in a world that had fallen and was broken. Everybody else had pursued God and he challenged the wicked king. He said, we're going to see who the real God is. And so one man took on a nation. He took on false prophets. He took on a wicked king. And he said, y'all can have all day to do what you want. I won't need much time. I know, my God, I have a relationship with him. And so Elijah watched all the people and the prophets. They danced and cut themselves and nothing happened. But late in the afternoon, afternoon, Elijah built the altar. He put some wood on it. He told him to go get some water. He prayed a 63 word prayer and the fire of God fell. And yeah. he said that God that answers by fire, let him be God. It was a few years later God was getting ready to call Elijah home. And you know what Elijah went home in? He went home in a chariot of fire. God is a God yeah. of fire. I wish somebody would shout. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then there was three Hebrew boys. You know where they met the Lord at? See, they had served God. They had been faithful. They didn't eat the king's meat. They didn't worship the king's idol. And all of a sudden, they met the Savior. And where did they meet him at? They met him in the fiery furnace. But thanks be to God, the fire didn't hurt them. The fire didn't harm them. It just burned all the bandages and the bondages. Jesus showed up as the fourth man in the fire. And they walked out together. And all the land acknowledged he's God. Because he's the God of Jeremiah said, there's the word of God inside of me and it's like a fire shut up in my bones. And we all know you can't contain a fire and you can't let a fire without burning and consuming. And Jeremiah was going, it's a fire shut up in my bones. God's a God of fire. Amen. He's a consuming fire. Then the story of the New Testament where Jesus has risen from the dead and he meets two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they didn't recognize who he was. And so Jesus asked them what's going on. They said, well, where have you been? Have you not heard all that's going on? How they crucified him? And, and they told him. And then Jesus, they didn't know who he was. They were so blinded by sorrow. You may be here today. And you're so blinded by sorrow and grief that you don't see Jesus. And he's right here. But those two disciples were blinded by grief. They were blinded by sorrow and burned. They thought hopelessness. They had lost all faith.
way. Can I tell you, Jesus should show up right when he needed him. And so Jesus walked down to the road of Emmaus with those two disciples. And Jesus, from Abraham and Moses, told them all about the scriptures. And then they invited him to their house. And then he broke bread and they realized who he was. And then in Luke 24, 32, here's what those two disciples said. They said to one another, did not our heart burn? <laughs> Didn't our heart burn when that man was speaking? No wonder your heart was burning. You was talking to the Lord. Yes. yes. Woo! Hallelujah. When Jesus is the center of all things in your life, the fire of God will show up. Amen. When Jesus is the focal point of all that you do, when Jesus is the reason you get up, the reason you go to work, the reason you come home, the reason you go to church, it doesn't matter if everything falls apart. When Jesus is the center of all things, the fire will be there. Amen. So our text tells us today, in Matthew 3.11, Jesus said, I want to baptize you. That's fully submersed. Baptize you with what? With the Holy Spirit and with fire. Acts 1 and 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. And then we see in Acts chapter 2, you can read the account. On the day of Pentecost, not only was the Holy Spirit poured out, but the Holy Spirit was poured out with fire. Fire representing the power of God in their lives. In the Old Testament, God would set things on fire. God would set people on spiritual fire for him. God consumed the altar with fire. God judged people with fire. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? It was the fire of judgment. But after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension, after he poured out the Holy Spirit, God said, I don't care about putting things on fire anymore. I don't want to have to up anymore. I don't want to have to use a flaming sword anymore. I want some people that I can ignite with the fire of the Holy Ghost. Yes. I wish I could find somebody to help me preach today. God yes. wants to set somebody on fire today. When you read about the lives of those 120 in the upper room, men, women, the mother of Jesus was there, some disciples were there, others were there, 120 people in the upper room. They obeyed God and the Holy Spirit came and was poured out. And they spoke in other tongues as the Spirit gave others. And the Bible said that it was like a fire that was on each one of them. And for the rest of their lives, those 120 people turned the world upside down. When I read about the likes of Paul, Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, they were on fire for God. They turned the world upside down. They suffered. They were persecuted. Paul talks about being shipwrecked and beaten with rods. He was snake bitten. You know why the snake bit him? Because he helped keep the fire going. Yeah. He got off the boat and said, even though I'm the preacher, I need to do some work. I need to work to keep the fire going. So the Bible says, Paul, when he got to the island, uh, uh, Matthias, that he brought and went and got some wood, he laid on the fire. Can I tell you, when the fire comes, the snakes will leave. Amen. Some of you got snakes in your life. You got things that are, are sucking you dry. There's things that don't belong. It's venom that's bringing poison to your soul. But if you don't build a fire of the Holy Ghost in your life, the snake I have to go. Yeah. So Paul helped build that fire. He laid wood on it. The snake bit him. And then they all said, oh, he's must have done something bad. They all waited for him to die. And when he didn't die, they thought he was a god. Paul said, no. When you read about these men and women in the New Testament, how they, they changed the world. Remember, fire burns. Fire consumes. Fire always changes its surrounding. Fire goes off heat and light. Fire purifies. It's how they get gold and silver. There's something about fire that attracts people. Fire causes excitement. And yes, there's a fear of fire. And what God is looking for in this last hour is for some folk that will say, Lord, here I am, ignite me. Yes. Lord, I want to be a vessel. I want to be used by you. Set me on fire. God's looking for some people that he can consume so they can be a light in a broken, dark, dying world. That's right. You know why the world don't fear sin no more? Because there's nobody much left that's filled with the fire of God. Where's the yeah. conviction at? If God would get a people that'd be on fire for him, then others would be convicted by the power in you. 
God is looking for some people to be a witness for him. To be bold, to be excited, to have a passion and zeal for him. And today, you're either on fire for God or you're not. There's no middle ground. Now, let's be honest, you can't hide a fire. Right. Oh, you can put one out, but you can't hide it while it's burning. Amen. Amen. Those in the upper room, they burnt on fire for God the rest of their lives. They had a passion to love Jesus no matter what. If the world hated them, they said, that's okay. God loves me and I love him. Amen. They suffered. And it cost them their life. But they remained on fire for God. Because they knew to be absent from the body was to be present with the Lord. And they didn't care. They said, we're going to burn for Jesus. And that church in that day was on fire. What's happened to the church today? Why are we no longer on fire for God? These churches are throwing couches up on the platform and having an interview. That ain't church, people. Amen, man. What has happened to the church that was once on fire for God? A church of people, a family, a person, a teacher, a leader, a preacher, a man, a woman, a boy, a girl. What happened? What happened to that one that was so consumed by the fire of God that they were bold, they had a zeal, they had a passion, and there was nothing that could extinguish the flame? Sadly, the fire didn't last long. In Revelation 2, 4, Jesus is talking. He's talking about the church ages and the condition of the church. And here's what he says. Nevertheless, I have this against you. I don't want God to be against me, church. Uh -oh. I mean, I, I try to get along with everybody, but I've just found that it's impossible. But I try. But I don't want God to be against me. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left, abandoned, forsaken who? Your first love. Remember, <coughs> remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent, do the first works again or Jesus said I'm going to come and I'm going to take your candle and I'm going to remove it from its place. I know this, is going, this may offend you. I'm not trying to offend you. I'm just here to tell you the truth, okay? This scripture right here takes eternal security and throws it out the window. Amen. If God said that you once had a candle that was on fire, if you was on fire, you first had to be saved. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Right. Something happened in the course of your life. You let the fire go out. Jesus is giving you an opportunity right here to burn again for him. And if you choose not to, you can't, you, you, you can't argue with Scripture. He says, I will come and I will remove the candle from its place. Let's break this down for a few minutes today. Let's relate it to life. Many marriages today are in ruin because divorce in the church, 52%. Of church folks have been married and divorced. Most children today under the age of 18 come from a broken home. What happens? Well, somebody in the marriage, their love and passion dies for their spouse. Well, why did it die, preacher? Because the things you used to do, you didn't do any longer. See, you used to be gentle. They used to be the apple of your eye. Nobody else mattered. They were the best looking. They were the sweetest. They were the most great. You used to open doors. You used to listen. You used to dress up and go on a date. You were proud of who you were married to. Something happened and you stopped doing those first works. And you began to only think about yourself. Amen. Boy, it's quiet in church today. And the only reason you got married is because they look good, you're in trouble. Because gravity has a way of taking effect. Yes. Amen. Body parts move, hair fall out, the eyes go dim, the ear can't hear. Amen. Amen. That's right. 
And what happens? You stop doing the things you used to do. The things that attracted you. The things that attracted them. You start thinking about yourself. And then you start looking other directions. Wonder what they would be like as a husband or wife. Wonder how to be, be married to them. Oh man, I'm going to go pursue that. I know it's uncomfortable right now. It's going to get better. And then you wake up one day and realize what's happened to my marriage. This is what Jesus is talking about here in Revelation. Hey, it takes work to keep a fire burning. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but we had a wood stove when I was, when I was a kid. Amen. And my job, I don't know how I got it. I'm only kidding. My job was to keep the wood stacked up on the carport and the handle of the mark. It burned like it below that mark. And my job was to carry the wood on the inside of the house. And I always had to keep that water on the stuff. Amen. That was my job. And my job was to carry the ashes out because the ashes pile up, it won't burn. It'll make a bunch of smoke and choke. It takes work to keep fire burning. When I got a little bit older, I was introduced to a go devil and a sledgehammer. Amen. Can y'all not buy an automatic wood splitter? Nope, we got you. <laughs> and then when I was a teenager, I got introduced to a chainsaw. You go out in the wood and get your own? Right. What if I cut my leg off? Be careful. <laughs> it takes a lot of work to keep a fire burning. When you're born again, when you surrender to Jesus Christ, guess what? You're part of the church. We're not talking about the Hyken Church or the Baptist Church or the Western Church or the Presbyterian or the Methodist or the Lutheran. We're talking about the church of the living God, the church that God's coming at. When you're born again, you become part of the church. You become engaged to Jesus. You become the bride of Christ. But here in Revelation, the bride fell out of love with the bridegroom. They, they lost their fire. Why? Why did this church in Revelation lose their fire, their zeal, their passion? Because the things they once did, they stopped doing. And so here in Revelation chapter 2, Jesus tells us what we need to do. The first thing he says, if you want to get back on fire, remember. When you read the life and the history of Israel, when they, back, when they were backsliding, and they would worship other idols, and they would intermarry with people that didn't believe like they did, and they would go astray and abandon God. It was when they reached the darkest part of history that somebody would say, hey, remember, there's a God that delivered us out of Egypt. There's a God that sent ten plagues. There was a God that let us cross over the Red Sea on dry ground. There's a God that fed us manna. Yeah. There's a God that built our fire by night and by night. There's a God that sent us coil. There's a God that had a rock follow us around. Where is that God? And they begin to cry out here in Revelation chapter 2. Jesus is saying, you better begin to remember. Remember what? What do we need to remember? Remember where you've fallen from. Remember the things that you used to do when you first met Jesus. Amen. Amen. The reason you can tell if someone's had a genuine Jesus encounter, <laughs> genuinely saved, is they can pinpoint a time in their life and say, at that moment, I gave my heart and life to the Lord, and then you can talk to people around them. And they said, oh, something changed. The great revival back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the coal miners in Virginia. They had a revival that broke out. And these coal miners came. And they were saved and born again. And then they went back to the coal mines. And they used horses to pull the coal in and out. And there was such a change in those men's lives. They couldn't figure out why the horses wouldn't listen to them. Because there was such a change. They talked different. They didn't curse no more. They were gentle. They were kind and compassionate. They had to rechain those horses. See, when you've had a God encounter with Jesus, there will be a change. And all of a sudden, you cannot wait to get to church. Yes. You can't wait. 
When you first were born again, you didn't care what anybody thought about church or your God. And you told everybody about Jesus. You bragged on him about what he did and how they needed him to. You weren't ashamed. You prayed and talked to God every day. You gave to God. You worked for God. You'd come and clean and thank your youth leaders and teenagers. They cleaned the church last night. Yes, they did a wonderful job. Thank you. They came and worked they later. Leaders and teenagers. When you were first born again, you were not ashamed of who Jesus was. And you know what? You were so on fire for God, it didn't matter if you was at Sweet Frog, Taco Bell, McDonald's, or the restaurant. You said, i got to thank God for this food, and you'd bow your head, and you didn't care who was looking at you. Right. You didn't let anything get you down because you were on fire. But over time, something happened. That little whisper came in your ear. You don't have to do all that. That's too much. And over time, you slowly stop doing all the things that you once did. You begin to slip. Instead of worshiping God, now you complain about everything. Instead of witnessing the gospel. You become too busy in life to spend time with God. Absence never makes the heart grow fonder. Absence always makes the heart wonder. Yes. And so your love for Jesus began to grow cold and the fire went out. Now that does create a problem because there is no cosmic battle between good and evil. That battle was fought in Calvary. And when Jesus shed his blood, the victory was won. Yes. And when he walked out of the tomb, we men too won the victory. Yes. Yes. So there's no cosmic battle between good and You know what the battle is? The battle is if you're going to listen to the devil or not. That's right. He's already been defeated. And the devil has a way of throwing a wet blanket on those who are on fire for God. How does he do it? He brings problems into your life. Amen. Amen. And so you start looking at the problem. And you listen to the devil. The devil goes, well, if you were saved, that wouldn't happen. When you paid your tithes, that, that wouldn't happen. When you go to church, <laughs> see, you didn't have to do all that. God don't love you. God don't care about you. The devil brings problems into our lives like a wet blanket. He'll even bring sickness. The devil will use peer pressure. Listen, peer pressure don't end when you get out of middle school. The devil will use people. Amen. And he'll use money. As a wet blanket. See, so many people, the fire has gone out. How do I know? Because you never smile. It's always negative, complaining. You're always worried, stressed, grumpy, upset. And if you was to worship, it only be your favorite song. And you look for a reason to miss church rather than to find a reason to go. And even sins appear. Because we stop doing the things we want. Jesus is telling us, remember what you used to do? Remember how you used to love me and you used to want to get to church? You used to want to read and pray? You used to want to witness? Does anybody remember those days when you first got saved and your sins were washed and you got up clean and you felt refreshed and you were so glad your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life and you were going to heaven and God didn't kill you in your sins? Does anybody remember? Yes. But something about time, we stopped doing all the things we did. And Jesus is saying there's hope today. There's hope for the church to burn again. There's a chance for those who have grown cold to be ignited again. There's hope. There's good news. Why? Because God's love for us is still burning hot. Yes. God's love for us has not wavered. Yes. It hasn't faded. For God so loved the world that He gave. Even while we were sinners, He gave. God still, if God didn't love you no more, you wouldn't be here. God loves us so much He gives us another chance. And so what, here's what Jesus says. He says, remember what you used to do for me. Remember. And Jesus says, repent. What does that mean? Repent. Once you remember what you used to do, then you've got to turn to that and turn away from the things that you shouldn't be doing. Yes. Right. Repent. Turn the other direction. And do your first works again. 
It's just like a marriage. When you stop doing the things you used to do, the marriage is trouble. I'm guilty. I am so guilty. I used to buy my wife flowers. I need to get with it. Amen. Used to write cards. I remember when we were first married. It drove me crazy for a little while until I stopped. Then she missed it and because uh, I didn't know lipstick with that much money. <laughs> but you know, they got these girly movies they watch and it paints a picture that ain't true. I thought some man would say amen. <laughs> <laughs> but evidently, you know, all women watch that movie when they was a kid about the, the honeymoon and the, the white horse and never no stress or no work. Or, uh, I need to burn that movie. Amen. <laughs> So I would in the morning, right after we got married, I'd take her lipstick and I'd write on the mirror, I'm glad you said yes. But I stopped doing it. Because some whispered in me, oh, that's silly, you already have her. It's the same in church. See, when you're born again, you take on the ring of engagement. Because Jesus told the story about the bridegroom's going away. <laughs> and so we have time to get ready for the marriage. Amen. We don't know when he's going to return. He paints a picture that he comes like a thief in the night at the midnight hour when nobody's looking. And the cry goes out and he catches his by surprise. Like a marriage, Jesus is saying you need to go back and do the things that you used to do. The things that you did when you were first saved. Even if life is falling apart and you're out of money and the house is a mess and the kids aren't listening, he says if you'll start worshiping me again, if you'll start being faithful to me again, church, yes. may I encourage you, we have Wednesday night service. Yes, amen. We have Tuesday prayer if you're not working at the noonday hour. We have men's fellowship, women's fruit of the Spirit. We have times to come together and get together. Jesus said, start doing all those things you used to do. Start worshiping, start being faithful, start telling people about me. You don't have to preach to them, just look them in the eye, eyeball to eyeball, and say, Jesus loves you. Amen. He got a plan. He's not Amen. mad at you. I love going to Walmart and tell them, I say, God's not mad at you, sweetie. God loves you with all his heart. He's got a plan for your life. And I found out that the tears had to begin to flow. And when I walk in the door, they'll look for me. What was that you said? I said, Jesus loves you with all his heart. He's not mad at you. He's got a plan for your life. Amen. Start witnessing again. Start working for him again. Let the joy return to your heart. Why? Because your name's written in the last book of life. When you and I start doing the things that we did when we first were saved, the fire will come again. The fire will be ignited again. Suddenly there'll be a stirring. There'll be an excitement. There'll be something building up inside of you. You won't be able to wait to get to church or to tell somebody about Jesus. I don't want to be on fire for him or anybody else. Hallelujah! Go back and do the things you used to do. Pick up the Bible again. Nowhere in Scripture does Jesus say how long you're supposed to read and pray. He just says read and pray. There's some days I pray long and read a lot, and there's some days I, I read a little and pray a little. But notice what happens if you don't. Here's the tragedy. He says, or else I will come quick. In other words, he's going to show up suddenly and he's going to remove your lampstand, your candle, from its place unless you repent. It's like a marriage. How long can a spouse stay with somebody not being faithful? I, I don't know why me and my wife talk about this, brother. I don't know what we do. I, I, would you stay with me if I cheated on you? No! But then in the back part of your mind, when you're not, oh, God, what would I do? Yet we expect Jesus to stay with us. And we're not being faithful to Him. 
But he's saying, if you let the fire go out, I'll give you a chance to reignite it. I'll, I'll give you a chance to repent and do your first works again. But he says, if you don't let the fire come back into your life, he said, unless you repent and do your first works, he said, I'm just going to remove you from your place. And he's going to put somebody else in your place. See, what good is a candle that won't burn? Sure. You ever try to light candles on a birthday cake? There's always that one that don't work. I don't try to light twice and throw it away. There's always the one in the pack you can light it up. You light it and it won't, it won't stay lit. And you just say, whoop, you can put another in there. That's what God's telling his children today. He's saying, don't let the fire go out. If it does, here's, the, here's how you fix it. Go back and do your first works again. So today, as the music plays softly and you stand, I wonder if the fire has gone out. I, I wonder if the passion for God has died. Have you left your first love? Have you got so busy with life? We, we're, we're all guilty. Working, children, family. Listen, stuff's expensive. It takes two or three incomes now just to make ends meet. But here's the day. Here's a chance. Here's a moment to say, Lord, I want to be back on fire for you. I wonder if anybody come and stand with this preacher as